Hello, everyone. So my name is Christopher Mitchell. I'm head of department for game design and programming at Vancouver Film School. Uh, and I'm joined tonight by Luca Casiudo, who's actually a, an old student of mine. Uh, it's always nice to have a game design grad here. But he's, uh, of course, gone on to do lots of cool things in the industry, care of starting his own game design, his own game company, which is tremendous. I know some of our students or maybe some people who are thinking about coming to the school starting an indie company is very much sort of uh, something that's on their mind. So obviously we'll talk about that tonight, but we'll also talk a bit about, um, shall we say kind of the, the game design patterns that influence the games that Luca's company is working on right now, or even sort of like other companies that we interact with over the course of our work. So anyways, hi Luca, nice to see you. Hello, hello. Thank you very much for having me here, Chris. This is, this is an amazing opportunity and yeah, I'm excited to go through it with you. Cool, yeah, yeah, it, it should be a fun time. now. Um, I guess the, the first question I'll ask you is, so, uh, you know, why bother doing it? Like, why, why go through the, the, let's face it, tremendous trouble of making an indie game company uh, versus uh, just doing sort of like the, the traditional game route of getting a job at a company somewhere? Absolutely. I will say that this decision was made um, the first time I joined BFS when Crew Film School. Uh, in my personal career, I was very fortunate to be able to basically follow my dream, and that was making video games. So it's pretty clear to me and the people around me that that would have been um, something that I would be passionate about and I would love to do for the rest of my life, basically. So thanks to BFS, I was exposed for the first time to, in a smaller scale, of course, to a game development cycle. At that point, um, after going through this process, I realized that I would want to give it a shot myself. And all the people that were around us, they were very excited to get together and treat this as professionally as possible to give it a shot. And yeah, we got mm -hmm. here in a, in a, in about a year or so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, you're, you're getting close to beta on your first game now, which is to say Boombox. So uh, why don't you tell the audience a bit about Boombox? Yeah, so the idea of Boombox, it's uh, obviously has been part of a journey to get to this point, um, yeah. also to you know shape it with the way that we want it to be. We are beta ready, and now we're preparing for a closed beta event uh, that will happen in the second week of January. Um, I guess I can tell you a little bit about how we came about that title and overall the general of the game. So we started by first analyzing and try to understand uh, what would be the most compatible platform for the size of the team and for the team expertise and also passion. Um, something to mention, obviously, every person in our team is a gamer, uh, big surprise. <laughs> obviously this is something that, you know, drove a lot of, um, you know, insight on where to point at for the type of game or genre that we want to target. But once again, based on the strength of the team, we first narrowed down that we wanted to try and play in VR. Uh, mainly because for us it was a big, a bit challenging uh, trying to understand where are the process in VR, how do you develop a game in VR, and we start researching on that matter, and we couldn't find a lot of stuff at all, actually, <laughs> finding any sort of documentation, practice, or procedure on how to approach and tackle this difficult task was a challenge, and that in itself actually motivated us to keep pushing and try to learn more about VR. So. Long story short, uh, what we decided to do there was to first try to prototype a game that will be compatible with that technology and giving us the opportunity to start discussing. But unfortunately, the first prototype that we made was not the one that we were really happy to see. Uh, in fact, we start receiving a lot of feedback from the community internally first, and then the media network that we started to expose to. And it was pretty clear to us that that was not the prototype that we wanted to do. So at that point, uh, what we did, we started dissecting and analyzing any sort of compatible game or similar game in the industry, looking at the major uh, genre in the industry, looking at what is trending and what's not. And there was a pattern that was related around the music and the rhythm element to it. Um, so we didn't decide from the get-go that Boombox was going to be a rhythm game, which it is a rhythm game, but it was more for us to try to understand what is the core mechanic for the game that we could build upon. And for us, uh, it happens to be through a process, basically interacting with 3D items um, at a beat of the music. So that shaped this idea of Boombox that it is right now. So in a nutshell, Boombox is a rhythm game developed for VR. And um, we really want to bring back this feeling of being a gamer from the 90s, so, such as myself, right. uh, to bring back, yes, this strong nostalgia elements. And we also believe that uh, you know, with the strong element of music, um, it will be easier to convey that state of flow and immersion, which is critical in VR. Mm -hmm. Now, at this point, as, as the game's sort of coming together and you're figuring out what it's supposed to be, do you have like a, a, a milestone structure in place, like a delivery date, or is this proper indie, you know, it's done when it's done kind of thinking? 
yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks for the question. Actually, we follow the structure that was thought by VFS actually in the beginning. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yes, absolutely. We started with a concept, and then we dove, dive into documentation research. Uh, try to hit our own prototype milestone. Once we got to the prototype, we verify. We start the testing to get feedback around. As I mentioned, we went for a second prototype <laughs> before it mm. being secure. Of, okay, this is the game that we want to bring to an alpha. Then after that, we got to an alpha stage. Most recently, we got to a beta, and the release candidate will be coming up on February 26th, which is the release date of the, the game. Oh, very cool. Okay, and just pushing out on Steam or the uh, o- Oculus Store, what do we think? Both of them, yeah. yeah. We, were, uh, we were able to basically have, um, to find a library that will allow us to release the game for multiple platforms from the get-go. Mm-hmm. So we are in the process. We've been already accepted by Steam, so the game is already there to be wishlisted for people that are listening. But um, mm-hmm. Yeah, we, we were targeting both uh, because we also understand the, um, the difficulty nowadays for most of the games being tied to a specific platform. We want to mm-hmm. make it as accessible as possible. So the game is going to be available right away for, at this point, for Rift, Quest, and Vive. So yes. Oh, Quest. Okay, that's a good surprise. That was my next question, actually. Yes. Uh, <laughs> now, after spending a year working on a VR game, so what are the VR best practices? Because as you say, like there's not a lot written about it. I can find academic papers on like motion sickness in VR and whatnot, right? But not a lot of sort of positive design trends. Yeah, I mean, it, answering this question would probably cover the whole seminar time if I have to give you yeah. all the, the, the practices, but I can tell you what worked well for us uh, or some of the big wow moments. Um, what we quickly realized is that um, based on the technology itself, right? It's highly immersive. So the UX and the UI, it's quite big uh, Mm -hmm. because having a UX experience where the player is not able to connect immediately to the technology was for us the biggest surprise. Like we started from, um, you know, prototyping and thinking from a different dimension of, okay, I'm prototyping this, it looks nice on the screen. So it should be working well in VR. But then the moment you plug in the VR headset, it was a completely different experience. Any sort of, any sort of detail, any sort of light, any sort of perspective, anything was playing a huge, huge role in the overall experience. And that was, for us, the main goal, try to get the player as soon as possible in a state of flow. Why is that critical for us to get them to in a state of flow was mainly because we really understand that for them to be able to enjoy the experience and to be fully immersed, they need to be able to get it immediately and get connected immediately. And that is, an art in itself, I will say. There are so many variables and elements that can contribute to a disconnection to that experience mm-hmm. that for us, it was mainly starting to test it, be absolutely blunt in giving feedback um, and exposing people to the, the prototype or the things that we wanted to get mm-hmm. to see whether or not we were able to validate our hypothesis. Unfortunately, I mean, fortunately as well, I will say, but our approach was based around hypothesis. So we were hypothesizing, we believe that, for example, by doing such and such, the user experience will be this. But before we were able to validate that, we had to go through a long process, which was interviewing a lot of people, inter- talking to the community. Community engagement has been the biggest drive for us. Uh, talking to people from the, the, the industry to get insight and so forth. So. Okay. Yeah, we. I was talking with one of the creators of uh, Darkest Dungeon uh, a little while ago, and uh, that was an interesting one because he was talking about how, you know, they've got a big community, uh, a lot of people interact with them about the game, but uh, they don't really, um, they don't really pay attention to the specific feedback points, which I thought was interesting because they'll have five people will say a boss is bad and five people will say a boss is good, you know, and instead, more what they do is they kind of count up how many people have something to say about an issue, right? So they sort of say that, oh, 10 people are talking about this boss. So there's something up with that boss. And they sort of use that method to, to figure out where they should be spending their effort. Is that similar to what you guys do for community management? Or are you, or are you doing more traditional, like let's read their case stories and, and try to yeah, understand their perspective? I think it's, um, it's a bit of both. Um, yeah. Mainly, so we have people that were dedicated entirely to interviewing. Uh, community and users. Uh, for us, it was more divided into, um, let's say, different uh, section of the pipeline. From a visual standpoint, for example, we were focusing on very targeted questions to narrow it down to what the point, the pain point was for these people. Or in general, the, for us, it, was more, it wasn't even about finding what they had to say. It was more about the reason behind it. 
Yeah. So if someone would tell us, I don't like this for a specific, or I don't like this for any reason particularly, we would try to open up the conversation and let them say as much as they can for us mm. to get insight. Yeah. So it wasn't really tied to the amount of people pointing at specific thing. It was more tied to the different section of the pipeline, which can be design, mm. on the visual side, um, on mechanical side too, maybe on the programming and systems as well. Okay, okay. Um, now I've got a, a question here in the Q&A. And actually, it's a good point for me to remind everybody that there is a Q&A. So feel free to, to make use <laughs> of it. We'll, we'll keep an eye on that. Um, so someone's asking, um, is it possible for someone, they say, for example, a designer that's not a gamer uh, to be working on a game design project? Like just as an organization, how important is it to you that every team member is a gamer? I mean, I know you guys, I know you are all gamers, <laughs> but like, is that is that a principle of the company or is that happenstance? What do you think? Yeah, I would say, you know, without uh, discourage, trying to discourage anybody, uh, but I will say that being a gamer, it's probably 80% um, yeah. of being a designer. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's, you know, it's quite simple because when it comes to having to design and be critical about something that you're truly passionate about and you do on your spare time as well, then it becomes a natural process. You don't really have to think too much. Being yeah. a gamer, you understand what is the best practice. So what for you makes that experience as engaging? Uh, yeah. And at the bottom line, the question that we were asking ourselves all the time through production and we still are, is the game fun? Yeah. Uh, if you don't have a metric or comparison of you know what, what a game should look like, I see that as a challenge. <laughs> and we, you know. Now, obviously that's a really subjective judgment though, right? Whether a, a game is yeah. fun or not. So do you have any metrics? Like I know like Rare, for example, for years, they used to count uh, number of button presses per minute as sort of their metric of like whether something's exciting or not. So do, for Boombox, do you have anything like that you try to follow or is it more just engage with the community and, and reflect back? Yeah, there, there are a few things to, to mention on that side. Um, I will say one of the basic principle for understanding whether or not it's, it's fun or uh, in general was for us to be able to understand how quickly a person can learn the game and how much depth is offered for people that are like hardcore or yeah. heavy games. So that ties into the principle of, you know, easy to learn, hard to master. Right. Uh, but it wasn't really a metric for us. It was more, are we able to have fun with our own creation internally first? Mm -hmm. And that's the biggest question to answer. Um, for us, we were really fortunate to have majority of the core team, uh, which is made of, right now we're 13, but the core team of full, full timers is nine people. Those people are truly passionate about rhythm games. So yeah. um, we, we tend to be highly critical internally first. And for us, it's more about, would you play this game without having to work on it? Is this mm -hmm. something that you will play in your spare time or that you generally have fun playing with? And yeah. you know, it sounds like something quite, uh, that can consider a cliche in a way, but it is, it was giving us a lot of insight because in many cases, there were answers that were revealing a huge, huge piece of information that was hidden such as, mm -hmm. for example, yes, I will play it, but I'd rather do this thing instead. Yeah. So that was already a leap for us to understand, okay, you know, we have to work on that specific aspect. And then yeah. bringing that content out for other people to, you know, start giving us feedback. Right, right. Yeah, I, I, I worked on an open world game years ago, and there was a uh, sort of this moment where the game just wasn't much fun, I have to say. And one of the programmers said something along the lines of like, like everything in this game I can already do in the real world. You know, like, which sort of show that there was some massive disconnect between sort of the whole point of working on the game. Um, now, Sebastian's got a question here for you that uh, you're in a much better position to answer than I am, which is, uh, I've recently started development on a rhythm game of my own. Uh, what are the core elements of that genre, essentially, that we should be most mindful of? Yeah, I mean, obviously, um, starting by the definition of what a rhythm game is, right, it's performing an action at the beat of the music. I will say if for a game to be properly called that way. Um, the, we found that there is a distinction basically from obviously music and dance games and rhythm games. A proper rhythm games for us or some of the major aspect that needs to be there is the ability to have uh, precision and dynamic and choreography tied to the beat. Um, and you know, you have to be precise on that sense. Otherwise um, the whole experience is gonna be ruined if uh, there is no precision and fidelity to what the beat of the music is. Mm. Additionally, it's also um, being able to understand what a music has to offer in terms of dynamic, um, such as in our case, for example, some songs, and right now we're going through the process of selecting the songs mm. uh, and the music that in general will be provided by the game. It's also try to understand, okay, is this music playable in, in a view of, is this going to be considered a rhythm game if we plug in this type of music? So 
have an understanding of what kind of patterns the music can offer into the rhythm game uh, visuals and let's say dynamic, it's critical. It's absolutely critical because it can be songs. It's not just as simple as plugging in a song, but for us, there were songs that we thought that were good, but once they were put in place into a system of matching all the beats and tracking everything, it was not an enjoyable experience and it didn't feel like a rhythm game at all. Yeah, I found lots of rhythm games where I'm supposed to be very aware of the music. I often find I'm a lot more aware of the visual elements in the game than the music or the beat. Um, it's, I mean, it's a tricky thing to get right. Um, Quite there's another question here uh, asking if there's any uh, specific games or other companies that inspired you or inspired uh, Boombox to a high, high extent. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I wouldn't tie it to a specific title, uh, mainly because we've been playing all the games and all everything that was compatible in VR. Mm -hmm. uh, but we had a well moment uh, at first, and this is uh, coming from a company that is local, uh, and it was for the game Pistol Whip. Uh, the mm -hmm. moment we played the game, um, there were a few realizations of you know how fun it was, how engaging pretty quickly, mm -hmm. and you know we move away from there. Obviously, you know I can mention a big title such as Beat Saber. Yeah, uh, it, it's been always you know a source of inspiration for us, um, mm -hmm. seeing the massive success that they achieved, and the limited in in a way complexity that was delivered on the game was for us, you know, a, a very promising lead uh, or a yeah. point, I was, I was saying. Yeah, but sometimes it can actually be a, a, a downside where there's a game that's such a landmark on the landscape that it, it's hard to, you know, not make that game, right? Um, I worked on a kart racer once and the amount of internal pressure to just make Mario Kart again was just like off the charts, right? Um, Understandable, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was, it, it was uh, a, a bit unusual to say the least. Now, um, you mentioned your core team. So how did the core team come together? Yeah, so uh, the initial part of the team, so we started right after finishing up uh, the Vancouver from school. So we ended up, uh, I'm a GD52. So um, we finished our class around uh, the last August. And right after that, um, there was a group of people that were in our class, actually close friends, um, that we started to talk together and talk about you know, the possibility of wanting to start a passion project that can turn into something professional. Um, and this is how we started creating the core team. Uh, but along the line was also, we've been through an actual recruiting process. Um, I'm fortunate because I have professional experience in recruitment and we went through a lot of people uh, to try to understand you know, who could be a good fit. Obviously, considering that we all have to work from home and you know, the isolation of lockdown was not making things easy, actually. It was mm -hmm. quite of a complicated situation for us. Um, but yeah, it was more trying to first relate with these people on the human level. Can we talk to these people? Can we openly speak about games and have fun generally talking about these things? Mm -hmm. Then obviously there was a regard, and I to regard to the technical skills, that is for sure. But being able to preserve that fine balance of people having fun first on an inclusive environment was our major uh, target when, yeah, you know, right. when approaching these things. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of literature about forming companies that talks about how the first like five people you hire sort of influence the the shape and tone of the corporate culture, like even years after they've left the company, which I do think is very, very true. Like I think it's like, you know, ripples in a pond more or less. Um, now our attendees might not know this, but uh, Luca's project at Vancouver Film School actually was uh, called The Cluckening, which won a Unity Award. It won Unity Student Game of the Year in, in 2019. And I'm just gonna drop it in the chat here. So hopefully everybody should be able to see that if they wanna check it out. It's a properly insane game, um, but an interesting one. And uh, I, I think it's actually kind of interesting that you guys pivoted from you know, something like that into you know, a, a VR rhythm game, which was a, a neat leap. Um, and I, I wanna make it clear too, I'm actually quite impressed by the way that the, the company held together and still shipped a game on time, just because like just at the moment the company's formed and you're gaining traction, you're scattered and told to work remotely, right? Yeah. Which is pretty, pretty impressive. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Now, uh, when you know the world returns to more normal, um, are you going to stay a remote studio, or at least in part a remote studio, or what do you think? I think we guy we. It's really important for us to stay in the same environment. Um, right now, we're forced to work, you know, from home and at different locations. We try to get together at least once a week, uh, mm -hmm. but only like with probably two three people at the time, keeping the distance just to have a chat. Right. Yeah. Uh, but for us, it's. Um, it's really important to be in the same office. And that has, you know, there's a lot to talk about that. Uh, specifically for us is the uh, inclusivity and the, and the excitement that you can drive by being in the same environment. It's one thing that, you know, you're sitting beside someone that is uh, prototyping an exciting aspect and you turn around and you can discuss. 
versus mm -hmm. having to bring that to the table during a meeting or or any sort of interaction that is uh, connected to working from home. So to answer your question, Chris, no, we would like to go back to the office. And uh, yeah, this has been the biggest blocker for us mm -hmm. uh, during okay, this time okay. of COVID. Yeah. yeah, I get that. Now, okay, now that you've done almost a full development cycle on a VR game, I guess the question is, uh, are your is your next game going to be a VR game or is, is that the roadmap for the company or do you think it's going to change shape from here? So initially there was a conversation around um, maybe targeting a different platform just to get experience on that as well. Uh, but I think right now we're consolidating the idea of wanting to proceed with another VR game mm -hmm. uh, simply because we already created a lot of systems and a lot of tools that can be um, proprietary to the company itself to keep developing more games. So Mm -hmm. In that sense, it would only make sense for us to keep uh, working on VR, and then I guess it will also depend on the success of Boombox, um, mm -hmm. which we plan on supporting for as long as possible to deliver new content. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they're, they're, the general idea right now is to deliver another VR game. Mm -hmm. right and now. you're a, a Unity company, I take it? Which yes, we're developing. <laughs> yeah, on probably turn off forty percent of the attendees just by saying that. But you know, that's that's statistics for you. Sorry, me. guys. <laughs> so um, how'd you how'd you wind up choosing Unity? That was um, that was an easy choice to be honest with you. It was yeah. more dependent on you know the main programmers, the core team of programmers, what they were feeling more strong about, mm. uh, and the answer was immediately Unity. Yeah. Uh, so you know we picked that route and we we stick to it. But, but we, yeah. we weren't we weren't excluding Unreal or any other engine uh, mm -hmm. from the get go. Absolutely not. It was more of a question for the programming side, and you know mm -hmm. Unity was the answer for most of them. So that's why we adopted. Yeah, and I mean, I've seen the game's beautiful. I've seen it. It's not like you, you suffered in any in any way there. Um, now, you mentioned you were a, a recruiter before uh, you decided to start your own company. So, how much has that kind of experience? How much has that life experience helped with your transition to game development? I ask that because a lot of people that come to VFS, they've got some sort of previous skill set, and they kind of wonder how well it's going to transfer to the new job. I would say they helped immensely, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I worked in recruitment sales as well, in management and a few other fields, but I would say recruitment served us really well, mainly because finding the right fit for the team can be a very tedious task. It's not just about you know having the right uh, fit technically, but it's yeah. more having the right fit that can work within this kind of organism, which is the team itself. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, the ability to talk to people and connect and generally assess on the go who can work well with the rest of the team was something that um, it really helped me out and helped us out as a company mm -hmm. to develop yeah. this whole team. Yeah. Right. Right. And and uh, I guess for people who are thinking about starting their own company, they're they're probably thinking about funding a lot. Uh, how long were you guys bootstrapped? How long did you just have to do this on your own? Yeah, yeah that's uh, that's interesting. So for um, for eighty to ninety percent of uh, all the people that are working in our company, mm -hmm. there was no salary, no pay, or anything like that for the first nine months. Mm -hmm. um, and this was something that you know, we disclosed it openly right at the beginning of the, the whole venture. We told yeah. everybody we were committed to a whole year of development, no matter what happened. Uh, and everybody was clear on that. But we were also helping people in, in making it clear that if any sort of opportunity from the industry will come up, please pursue it because we're not able at this point. Um, right. You know, we didn't want to compromise anybody's future or anything like that. Uh, but yeah, we went through um, a process of development of about nine to 10 months. Mm -hmm. uh, before we got founded. Um, and I have to mention this, it was all thanks to, well, it first started through IREP, uh, which mm -hmm. is a government uh, program that helps um, start up in companies to uh, grow in a way mm -hmm. on startup venture. And through them, we really value any sort of advice that was given. We were appointed at uh, entrepreneurship by UBC, um, another organization tied to the government as well, that gave us a lot of insight, tools, mentorship, uh, it helped us immensely in understanding mm -hmm. how to be an entrepreneur in, to, to, to start from, right? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, then finally, after nine months, um, we received the founding from Canada Media Found, uh, and we were able to pay everybody, uh, even though there were people like myself and the CEO who decided to put back into the company uh, our salary for a little longer, or just you know to have um, a bit more resources <laughs> tied to mm -hmm. the bank account of the company. Uh, but now, finally, we were able as well to get paid after 12 months. So mm -hmm. I will lie if I say that, you know, it's easy as a process. It is not easy. Uh, mm -hmm. There is a lot of work that needs to put up front with the uncertainty of 
will we get it? Yeah. It's always it's always there. But yeah, there has to be that initial sacrifice. Absolutely. Yeah. When, when when Chris was talking about uh, working on Darkest Dungeon, he said pretty much the same thing. You know, like yeah. at first they had uh, a seventy five thousand dollar loan, and that was it. And they just sort of like dragged that loan out on you know kind of hardware software costs. And then they did the Kickstarter, and the Kickstarter just paid for the loan. Like that was it, you know, and that was the extent of their funding. So you guys are actually in an unusually good position, it sounds like. Thank you. Yeah, we were uh, absolutely fully funded. I have to give a kudos to the, the CEO. The CEO mm -hmm. of our company really did an amazing work in that sense because um, she was able to follow all the advice and direction that were given by uh, the different entities that I mentioned before, such as IRA mm -hmm. uh, and so forth. And the foundings are there. There is so much support from the government. It's just a matter of putting the right work into it and being serious about it and committed. Yeah. Then, you know, if you see it through, it will happen. But it's just, you know, you have to get it to that stage. So. Yeah. And that seems to be a weakness of a lot of indie companies that don't make it in the sense that they just don't have that business acumen. Like they don't understand, you know, where the funding sources are supposed to come from and how they're supposed to get through that, you know, lean, lean year, as it were, while they try to get the first product put together. Um, yeah, and, and there is also the other challenge that I've seen uh, from the industry that the traditional way of getting founded, in most cases, um, it doesn't really grant you any sort of financial support that is not dilutive. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's for us the biggest advantage. Having a not dilutive type of founding right now, we didn't have to share any sort of ownership. Yeah. And I feel yeah. that that's also a limitation for a lot of, or a problem that a lot of indie companies are finding right now, not wanting to share too much of the ownership. And we are totally understanding that. Um, mm -hmm. So, that's that's an additional challenge. Yeah, you can get pressured into growth you don't want to, right? Like if you sign a particularly large contract and suddenly have to hire 50 people, you yeah. now have to do work for hire to maintain those 50 people. You know, you sort of get boxed into. Yeah, yeah, which could be a real challenge. We were, uh, we had um, uh, Jamie Chung, the the owner of Clay, uh, give a, a speech uh, for at a grad event actually. And he said basically as much like they they turned down a lot of big jobs because they knew in doing so they'd never get to make the games they want you know they'd just be turning into a work for hire studio no. now do you think you do work for hire though if it came your way or do you want to stay like fully kind of totally owned as you are right now i think we're going to fight as much as possible to stay as it is yeah yeah even if it's a warhammer franchise or something like that that's painful yeah <laughs> You know, I say that one on purpose. For those of you who don't know, Luca has like the world's biggest library of Warhammer stuff in his house. So, yeah. Yes. Uh, <laughs> thank you for like that. Yeah, Warhammer is absolutely my passion. And yeah. it would be uh, it's extremely excruciating for me to turn that down as an opportunity. Absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In our, in our conversations with indie companies, this comes up a lot. I've got to say this sort of tension between, you know, traditionally you make money by doing work for hire, which then pays for your passion projects, but then your passion projects never really get made. Absolutely. Uh, I think is a real kind of shortcoming there. Yeah. Like I worked for a work for hire studio for years and yeah, we had something like six or seven work for hire games for every one passion game that we even sort of started, you know, like it was just kind of ridiculous. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. But yeah. The, you know, the, around that topic as well, Chris, mm -hmm. I will mention as well that uh, the biggest um, element of excitement for all of us that has been a drive through all the difficult times has been the greater freedom. Yeah. Uh, so that for us, it was it was absolutely a drive. Uh, we've been we've been leaning on that a lot in every, any point of you know difficulty. Thinking about okay, this is our own baby. We created all this. Mm. Really help us to push through. And yeah, now we've talked about dates a little bit here. Um, Quentin's asking, so what's what what was the first month of proper production started on Boombox? First month of proper production. Yeah, because we've got a January January was that the release date or the beta release? January, uh, mid-January will be the um, uh, closed beta release. Um, okay. So it's the first time that we start showing the keys, um, mm. showing you know, the game to the public. Mm -hmm. um, for proper development, um, I don't recall at this point, what was it? Um, but we've been through, I will say, probably six or seven months ago, we started uh, mm -hmm. the proper production. Uh, yeah. But for us, for us, it was more, it wasn't a really a conventional path. We were trying to set up um, so maybe let's start from the uh, management uh, framework. Our management framework, it's basically Scrum or Agile approach. So what we did and what we were doing and what we've been still doing is to first tackle all the tasks, but also um, adapt depending on the feedback and on the need of the production itself. So for us was when do we have 
um, a prototype that we're confident enough to bring into production. And this is how we were, you know, trying to gather information on the sense of when do we set the milestone, but what really helped us out in deciding when is the production starting on when the milestones are going to be falling was to set up internal sprints. So we had our own sprints that were tied to a very clear goal that everybody was aware of. So we pushed ourselves to hit that sprint. And at that point we had an answer, like based on the status of this that we just accomplished, how long do you guys think it will take to get into this next stage or set up a milestone? And it worked really well for us. Obviously there was a lot of um, planning in advance, I would say, for, for the roadmap on how we wanted to work. But yeah, setting up internal sprints and uh, yeah, having this agile approach has yeah. been the way for us to hit it. Can you give us an example of one of these sprints? Like what, what's a chunk of content you would try to lock down in a sprint? A chunk of content can be, for example, right? We have um, some consultants that are coming out from the industry and they're coming to the office to wanting to check the game. So what do we want to show to these people? Uh, for example, the main mechanic. Um, what is the main mechanic? What kind of features do we want to show? Oh, we want to show the procedure generation system of the environment. So mm -hmm. our sprint will be having that tied to the main core mechanic of the game so they mm -hmm. can be fully displayed and get a full feedback on it. Mm -hmm. So that could be a chunk, but I will say it's, on a, it's, it's more on a weekly basis that we mm -hmm. try to have this uh, sprint. Mm -hmm. um, and it's always tied to mechanics or features that are directly corresponding to the overall experience at the core of what the okay. game is. Now you mentioned uh, procedural generation. Uh, students are always interested in procedural generation. Um, <laughs> now, why did you go that route and why not hand authored levels is I guess the question. Yeah, so the procedural generation is uh, in a way was friendlier with the system that we have in place lined up. Mm -hmm. um, but we also understood and realized that uh, there is a certain level of replayability when it comes to this type of games. Mm -hmm. um, and without revealing too much because we're still having to finalize it. Uh, but what we did here was to um, basically enforce and give as much power as possible to our users. Mm -hmm. So we want, we really believe uh, and we stand behind the concept of user generated content. Mm -hmm. uh, so by procedure generating the environments, we don't have to have them to go through the experience that we design. Instead, if the user likes a specific song or likes a specific type of environment, they should have the freedom to do so. So the procedure generated system for us was the sweet spot because the people can just go through like a, they can just click on a scroll down menu and select, I like this kind of environment. I like winter environment with metal music. Just cool. Random. Very uh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that will tie it in and they have the experience that is always ever changing based on their taste. So that's why. Okay, very cool. I like the sound of that a lot. That sounds that actually sounds fantastic. Thank you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Now, when we're thinking about sort of your next games, you want to do another VR game. Um, yeah. Are we going to, like, are you going to build upon sort of what you've learned about the rhythm genre? Or are you going to build upon the, you know, just the, te the raw technical knowledge of working in VR and do work in a different genre? What do you think? Yeah. Um, so, the, the strategy that's put in place or has been discussed so far with the company um, mm. is that we want to support this game as much as possible. So most likely, you know, majority of the team or part of the team force is going to be um, deployed into maintaining the game and mm. cre keep creating content. Uh, but for us, it's more about taking away the technical knowledge that we built. Mm. And uh, it doesn't have to necessarily be another rhythm games, but there might be components that were created for yeah. the rhythm game that we can use. The procedure generation system is one of them. Yeah. Or the difficulty calculation system can be another one of that. The score mm -hmm. system, same. Achievement system, same. We have a lot. It, the game is pretty heavy on systems that we created from scratch. So mm -hmm. all this piece and components can be dissected and removed from you know the boom box as a game mm -hmm. and be put into a context of how do we use this to shape a new experience. Mm -hmm. So it might end up being another rhythm game. We don't know. Uh, but yeah, right. it's more about the technical knowledge and the tools that were really developed in the first production. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now on the team itself, um, is the is, is everybody sort of put in the role of a technical designer? Like is everybody on the team scripting to build these systems or are these sort of spreadsheets that feed a system that a programmer has created? Like what kind of workflow do you use there? Yeah, so this is, uh, this is around our uh, philosophy in design. So what we tend to do here is to have the input of everybody, no matter where what they, their engagement is in the, in the pipeline in the production, uh, we would like to expose any sort of idea or concept to everybody to get the input. Mm -hmm. At that point, what happens is uh, the programmers are heavily involved in the design. 
um, the designer, the traditional designer is the person that puts down the idea. And just you know, to give an example, it will be such a, a, a situation in which, for example, the designer is the one that puts a big chunk of clay on a table and start to shape some sort of statue or form that they want to you know, mm -hmm. show to the rest of the team. And then it's up to the rest of the team to keep sculpting, to bring it up and make it as a concept. So um, for us, it was, once again, we went for the, from the theoretical discussion of we would like to implement this aspect mm -hmm. to the on-paper planning, uh, which is tied to technical documentation that normally is handled by together programmers and the designer. And then from the, for the execution, it's, um, it's always an iterative process where there is an initial step where the programmers are saying, okay, we brought to life this concept. And then they expose this to everybody in the team to give feedback. And once we get feedback, we can go for iteration two, three, four, and so forth until we land in the spot that we're you know, happy with. Right, right, okay. Now, um, since a lot of the game's appeal is gonna come from like mixing this music with this level that gets generated and just people saying like, this is cool, you should check it out. That suggests obviously like a big community that's going to talk a lot and you know share music for uh, whether it's good or bad. Um, so how are you guys planning to manage that community? Because that's one of the big headaches of indies right now is that you know we tend to have large unmoderated communities, which can prove to be rather troublesome. So you know what's a small indie company to do? Yeah. So in our case, um, we were very fortunate because we connected with other companies that develop game locally in VR. Um, I can mention one. We connected with Metanoff, for example. Sure. Yeah. Been in business for already five years, and they gave us some insight for where to start uh, building up this community. For mm -hmm. us, uh, the biggest takeaway was we targeted any sort of social platform to start seeing, okay, how do we develop a community and how do we get engaged into that? Uh, for us, the biggest return, which was also the suggestion given by Metanoff, was mm -hmm. uh, done by Reddit. Yeah. Uh, on Reddit, you know, the biggest community can be created. Uh, but at the same time, um, you know, we base it a lot on our Discord, where we have yeah. our operators, uh, mm -hmm. and we already are empowering a lot of people that are internally working on the production to help and guide the community to give feedback and keep the developers informed about the feedback that was given mm -hmm. at the community. At the same time, we have a third component, which is the back end, uh, which mm -hmm. service everything, and a proper website. So on the website, uh, what people can do and will be able to do it, is to have their own space where they can start, you know, chatting about what they like, what don't they like, any sort of suggestion, feedback. So there is going to be a person assigned to that community as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this is a little bit in a nutshell. There is a bit more in, in mm. the planning stage and the strategy, but yeah. Yeah, because I do think that's probably the biggest headache for indie companies out there right now. The fact that kind of everybody needs a live operation strategy. Uh, even if you have, like, even if you're not a free to play game or, you know, you, you have no kind of, uh, you know, DLC roadmap or something like this, but like engagement and maintenance of the community seems to be tremendous. Um, Absolutely. I, and that's going to shape the game. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, I actually, I genuinely believe that sort of management of online communities is the biggest problem in video games today. You know, like, like not monetization and not production or any of those sorts of things. It's just, you know, how do you maintain healthy environments for all your players? Absolutely. Which, is a nightmare. <laughs> yeah, it's it's the GDC talk I think that needs to happen. You know, like uh, community management for broke indies, right? So like before you've had like your major success that pays for your huge team. You know, um, and how do you actually like build that success? Build towards that success. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That's but I'm glad you're thinking about it already. Now um, I know the company um, sort of uh, let's say dabbles a bit in in machine learning and whatnot as well. Um, is any of that influencing? Boombox, or is that thing is that reserved for kind of your future projects? What do you think? It's actually heavily um, implemented already, influencing a bunch of the systems that we have right now. Cool, very uh, interesting. Yeah, uh, I don't know how much I can disclose at this point, right. but um, though, so when we applied for the Canada Media Fund, uh, mm -hmm. with the idea of the game that we had, we applied for innovation um, mm -hmm. in the stream that was available at uh, Canada Media Fund. And I would yeah. say that the, uh, the the knowledge that we had in machine learning here really, really served the purpose in a way because mm -hmm. uh, all the systems that we're creating are created in a way that we want this to be a dynamic experience that is not feeling scripted. So some of the you know fields where it was applied, um, I will say without, again, revealing a lot, uh, but in the um, difficulty calculation system, traditionally what you see in the games nowadays, it's always tied to a performance or a single song. In our case, we have an overall skill rating 
there is tied to so many variables and parameters that thanks to machine learning, we can track, predict, mm -hmm. and implement. Very cool. Um, yeah. yeah. So that's gonna that's gonna really create an experience where you know the player will have at hand all the results of what they did on an overall scale is gonna be available for them on their website so they can go back and improve upon. Um, mm -hmm. Since I don't know if I mentioned that as well, but the game is gonna also be quite physically active. So mm -hmm. people can literally have a workout by playing a game. Yeah, cool. <laughs> Very cool. I'm so glad to hear you're pursuing that. I think it's fascinating stuff. And I think I genuinely believe it's gonna break the video game industry. <laughs> like I think a lot, of, a lot of jobs are gonna go away. A lot of new jobs are gonna be created. It's gonna be a really interesting thing. Hopefully not a lot of jobs are lost, but yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I always believe that like, um, work's never destroyed, it's just moved around, you know, like, like in, you know, like motion capture is the great example of that, you know, like motion capture didn't reduce the number of animators, right? It just made more things that animators could do. It sort of extended what an animator could do, right? And I see the same sort of thing in, in machine learning and in game design. Now this, this next question is super for the people thinking about forming a game company, um, which is, uh, do you guys qualify for shred funds or uh, you do already? Yeah. We do. Yeah, okay. We're really working yeah. with them. Um, and the advice that I can give people is to keep track mm -hmm. of the hours or yeah. even the past. Um, in our case, we've been keeping track of all the work being put in place since day one. Mm -hmm. uh, people are submitting regularly the hours of work that they put it in place. Uh, there is a prerequisite for the shred, which is um, basically the money that you can back through that program is tied to the technical skills and suitabilities of what's been done. So this is why the documentation is a key element. Um, yeah when it comes yeah. to the shred but yes absolutely it's for people amazing. who don't know um shred is a, a really good canadian program that it's uh, scientific research and experimental development tax if you're curious that uh basically says making video games counts as scientific research so game companies can get a portion of their development costs back uh it's just it's a fantastic program yeah. it's up to 64 percent, so it's a reason what that is insane i had no idea it was that high <laughs> <laughs> that's genuinely ridiculous. I mean, good for you, but there you go. That's <laughs> Thank all right. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That'll be okay. All right. Um, I'm just gonna look at my notes here real quickly here. So, um, what's a, a surprising discovery then that came out of this? Like, what's what's the gameplay mechanic you didn't think you were going to have until it showed up in a prototype or in the middle of a sprint? I see. Hmm. Well, I have to think about that. Yeah, because I can't imagine it all ran on Rails. Yeah. The yeah. inverse, of course, is something that just doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's for sure. I think um, having an AI as well mm -hmm. implemented was a pleasant surprise. Um, we weren't really connecting any sort of AI to the experience of playing a rhythm game mm -hmm. or having some sort of interaction uh, with the environment. And uh, we just wanted to go for the experience of plugging in an AI that will function yeah. the virtual path in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, that was for us the, the element that really, you know, gave us a lot of web, well, like, it was a wild moment for us. Even just seeing the AI going around in the gameplay itself in, in the most simplest way, just running around for yeah. us was, was highly immersive. Um, and that, that was something that, it was a pleasant discovery for us. Mm -hmm. Also having, you know, interactable environments or at any sort of level in VR, it's, it's something that um, really changes the experience. Mm -hmm. Now, how did you guys arrive at your art style, by the way? <laughs> Was that like, did you, did you have a, a, a landmark you were moving towards or was that something that came as a result of uh, playing around in engine? It was, it was more of an organic process. Uh, mm. There was no, um, let's say planning around that type, mm. that, that type of uh, style in general uh, that we sort of defy on. It was more, um, it was more of a feeling. We started prototyping elements um, mm. and the art style came, came about naturally. That obviously, you know, also looking at the people that we had that were contributing to that part uh, visually. So the mm -hmm. artists we had, uh, we also looked at their strength and they happened to coincide with our vision. Additionally, um, what we noticed in VR, unless you know you want to go for a much, much, much larger production mm -hmm. of having everything hyper-realistic and with a lot of details, uh, going for a look that is a bit more stylized and more yeah. close to low poly um, will give you your best result for your buck in a way. Mm -hmm. Um, because it, it's really not that, um, obviously there has to be some sort of learning and process and knowledge to execute mm -hmm. that style. But for us, it was the most approachable look yeah. uh, based on the timeline and the resources that we had. Yeah. I always find actually uh, sort of photorealistic art is a little bit of a trap in games. Like, you know, the, the day it becomes trivial to execute is also the day we won't be interested in anymore. 
right? Yeah. And then yeah. art direction will be what actually uh, really matters. I mean, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, um, I think yeah. it's sort of uh, analogous with um, the way that, you know, all art was basically portraiture until we invented the camera. And then suddenly we had no interest in portraits anymore. Like, we, you know, we had to do sort of uh, wild, wild conceptual art, which I think is, is great. Um, now, as we sort of think about the future, what are kind of like the game design trends that most interest you right now, right? Like it doesn't mean specifically like the next game you're gonna make, but what are kind of the trends in gaming that most interest you right now? Like for me, it's community management and things like, you know, um, uh, masculinity in games and things like this, I find really, really interesting right now. So what, what is it for Luca? For me personally, mm. is to bring back the original design games. Um, mm. In a way, original design is something that um, might be overlooked in general because people mm. might think, okay, for example, a rhythm game is based on another success or another game. Yeah. But I'm really, really, really interested in having uh, this approach of originally creating something that doesn't have to be resembling any game out there at yeah. all. It can yeah. be based on something, but we would like to originally design experiences. And that's, that's once again tied to the fact that I'm a gamer from the 90s. I, I yeah. still remember in the 90s that, you know, when a game like Diablo, came out right the other one that made the general for the rpg in general for a lot of people like in, in the industry as well and that was an originally designed game nowadays when um, games are created in, in the design patterns and philosophy are always based on something that was successfully implemented in the past and then there yeah. is sort of you know implementation or modification or improvement of it versus mm -hmm. we would like to create something originally from scratch um, mm -hmm. that's what i'm really really interested about yeah, yeah, and I think I think companies like Clay come from the same place. Like none of their games nicely sort into a category, right? Like like Don't Starve is a fantastic game, and I could not tell you what genre it is, right? Yeah, um, and also too, like you talk about '90s games, like um, the one that springs to my mind is is actually a rhythm game too, like Parappa the Rapper. You know, like that's that's a fantastic game. I'll play it today. I've got it on my I played on my PS4 every once in a while. You know, like oh, wow. it's still it's still a good game, right? Um, but you're right in that it's so tempting and so easy just to do sort of like genre standard products. And yeah. it's hard to find success when you do that kind of thing. Yeah. Absolutely. And I found it limiting into the creation process as well, uh, mm -hmm. because setting yourself to, um, let's say, um, a guideline that was already put in place by someone else, I think mm -hmm. it doesn't really give you the opportunity of exploring and truly creating from a creative standpoint an original experience. Um, yeah. So that's why, you know. Mm -hmm. Now, as a as an indie company are you actually doing sort of localization in multiple territories or whatnot like making you know making the team do the translating for you it's been already done actually yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean cool. at this point, it's, you know it, it's not uh it's not a secret right now we have it translated obviously in english italian yeah and spanish yeah. Uh, the three languages but that's not because of a specific reason because the people that are working in the company yeah. speak the three languages yeah yeah <laughs> so yeah which it makes sense to me right. yeah <laughs> Yeah. Now, as far as you say, we're, you're at uh, 13 or 14 members now, of which nine are kind of full time. What sort of the, the distribution of, of roles look like? Like how many artists does a, a nine person company support right now? Yeah. Um, so right now we are 13. Um, mm -hmm. Plus, we also have consultants. Uh, there are yeah. people that have inside in the, in the industry and so forth. Some of them are our ex teachers at uh, the FS. Mm -hmm. uh, we're still in touch with them. Uh, yeah. But I will say the bulk of the team is revolving around the programming side. Uh, mm -hmm. I will say, so right now we have lead programmer, gameplay programmer, backend programmer, so three, four, five. I will say four, four or five people have to be knowledgeable in programming in, mm -hmm. in the type of team that we have. Yeah. Uh, then in our case, we also hired another VFS alumni uh, for music. We have a music mm -hmm. composer. Um, Obviously, you know, music is a big, big, big component in what we're doing. Yeah, I was wondering how you were dealing with music, whether you'd licensed it or sourced it or wrote it yourself. Or, yeah. yeah, actually, that opens up to another really interesting uh, topic. And this mm -hmm. is something that we didn't thought it was going to be that complicated. And as to being able to bridge in between the two industries, music and games. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, you know, right now it has been uh, recently uh, a major problem for a lot of games. That's the DMCA um, mm -hmm. of, you know, songs that have to be taken down. In our case, we're trying to completely avoid that situation by yeah. uh, purchasing or getting a pool of songs that is pretty clear for everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, and we are working now with a lot of music studios. Uh, they've worked with other games in the past. And, uh, you know, 
finger crossed, can't really promise too much, uh, but we are gonna be um, purchasing premium songs plus also providing a list of free songs for everybody to stream, share, mm -hmm. and do what they like with. Oh, very cool, that's a good deal. That's a really good deal. Um, yeah. I was speaking with an investor group uh, a few days ago and their big interest right now is actually securing video game company rights for you know kind of Netflix TV shows and things like this. Like, and I, I suspect that's gonna be a real growth area for indie companies, quite frankly, the way that they'll sort of be like testing ground for comic books and films and TV shows and sort of like all the other media they wind up touching, so. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, if you yeah, yeah, it'll be interesting stuff, really interesting, yeah. yeah. All right, so um, I'm gonna uh, uh, start taking some uh, extra questions here. So uh, if we do have questions, please start posting them up. Um, I've got a question from Austin here, who's currently studying at the 3D animation program and wants to work in games, uh, which is like, trust me, a question that comes up a lot. You know, I want to work in video games as an artist. Do I take 3D animation or do I do game design? So he's asking for modeling positions. Do you have any preference for somebody who takes, you know, kind of game design program versus the animation program? I really, I don't think that that's, there should be a distinction, at least for us. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's more about uh, the overall style and preference of the artist. Um, in yeah. some cases, you know, you have people that have incredible skills, but maybe their art style or the overall taste uh, for the animation in general doesn't really mm -hmm. fit within the vision that the game has in place. So it's very case case by case. I don't think there is a general answer for that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Th this question comes up a lot in in my own work too, and I. I'm glad it came up here because I genuinely don't think it matters. Like, I think your portfolio matters a lot, right? And obviously if your portfolio is sort of game centric, it should demonstrate, you know, a variety of styles, demonstrate that you can work efficiently, demonstrate that you can work quickly, right? Like, I think those are the things that matter most, but I don't think anybody really cares what your piece of paper says. Yeah, I mean, the, I think one of the biggest points that you mentioned right now, Chris, is the variety of styles. Uh, being yeah. able to show that, you know, you don't only just have one single preference or style that you like to execute on it versus yeah. your, you know, you can work on different styles and that's that's something that attracts a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of my favorite uh, game artists is a fellow called uh, Sean McMurchie, who has a, amazing sort of uh, uh, amazing inked drawings of quite kind of gnarly, um, like grotesque is, is the wrong word, but it's everything has sort of like an overwrought feeling to it, which I find quite interesting. And he's one of the lead artists on Plants vs. Zombies. You know, like he's just like completely out of left field, but loves it. It makes really cool stuff on that game too. Um, there you go. That's yeah, right. yeah. So I, I, I agree that that notion of like heavily stylized art is, is tremendously valuable these days. Yeah. Now for a, um, a designer or technical designer though, uh, what do you look for in, what do you look for in that sort of person these days? It's tied once again to the genre of the game. Uh, mm. For a technical designer, I would want, I mean, personally, uh, I would want to see the way they communicate their ideas. So the style yeah. in which they, they're able to articulate, as well as I think for a designer is really, really important to have, to be a little bit of a generalist in a way. The mm. um, reason why is because a designer works very closely in our case with programmers. And if the designer doesn't understand uh, what the programmer has to go through in order to um, fully understand and implement an idea, then there can be a gap in between and it's difficult to bridge in between that. Yeah. So I will say for the technical designer designing in general, it should be someone that has knowledge a little bit about everything in the game, uh, in, in the pipeline production, obviously, mm -hmm. to be able to speak to different departments. So the way of uh, articulating their thoughts, um, how do they um, visualize their ideas, it's also very important. So it's once again, tying back to your portfolio. Mm -hmm. uh, in many cases, you know, if you're looking at a portfolio of a designer, you would want to look at some sort of technical documentation that was created and how translatable is that according to the standards that the company is delivering. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it, in a nutshell, I will say that the biggest um, element is to be able to understand a little bit of all the parts of the pipeline. Yeah, I, I have to agree. I think sort of that, you know, ivory tower designer uh, doesn't really exist. And, and really never exists, right? Like people forget that, you know, the person who, who designed Magic the Gathering, you know, had a PhD in mathematics before he started out, you know, like these are, <laughs> these are quite rigorous things. But then he himself says that the math behind Magic the Gathering is, is poker level math. Like that's what he calls it, you know, like they can demonstrate a very strong understanding of, of systems. I've got a question here about um, hiring in the company. Mm -hmm. um, which I guess leads to the question of sort of company growth, you know, like your, your 
13 people now, nine core. Do you plan to stay at that size? Or do you anticipate growth in the company? Do you have an expectation of growth? What do you think? Yeah, we're looking at, uh, for the next game, we'll probably scale up to 25 people. Mm. Um, 25, wow. Yeah, yeah. We're looking to scale up uh, mainly, well, it's tied to the overall strategy of the company. Mm. Once again, building upon this, the systems and the tools that we already created. Uh, but also, if you follow the same traditional line of investment, yeah. uh, sorry, not traditional, I mean, through the same path that we took in, in, the, in the first production, mm. we will want to scale up to approach a much more challenging production. Yeah. And 25 seems to be a healthy number for now, based on our prediction. Mm. Uh, but hard to say, but it is definitely, definitely the intention of scaling up. Yeah. Yeah, anyway. yeah. I remember that the early Hothead games uh, were sort of at about twenty-five, and yeah, it seems to be kind of that that tip-over point into um, whatever you call high-end indies these days. You know, like <laughs> like is that I don't even know if that's considered AAA or whatnot these days. Um, yeah, now, uh, I don't have any more questions right now, but one thing I do want to say to the audience is uh, so. Ages ago, Luca's team was the one that got uh, the Unity Award for 2019. And actually there's a VFS team that's up for the Unity Award for 2020 right now. So if everybody could do me a favor and sort of click on the link I just dropped in the chat there and do a vote for a, a little game called Afloat. I'm sure those students would appreciate that because uh, they made their whole game in isolation, which I think is insane. And they still managed to get a real success out of it. And it's a gorgeous game using uh, talking about proceduralism, you know, they use Houdini inside the game. Like there's, there's lots of really cool stuff going on inside there. So. It truly is beautiful, guys. Go check yeah. it out. Yeah. 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 I very, very worth it. It's amazing. Okay. Um, any, uh, oh, here we go. Great. Braden, thank you. Uh, what would you say are the most important fundamentals of getting an indie studio off the ground? And then what was the most difficult challenge you faced at the start? Passion and commitment. Yeah. Um, this is the biggest thing. Um, it's not gonna. It's not an easy process. Uh, if people think, okay, I want to make a video game, I want to start up my own company, just because you know I like video games, mm -hmm. that can only take you, you know, so far. Uh, but yeah. the commitment is the is a big big piece. Uh, but I will mm -hmm. say for me myself um, and for what happened to the company, it was passion. We truly were passionate about wanting to establish this company as a game studio to have, you know, the tools and the resources to keep yeah. developing games. So that was our goal, and it was all driven by passion. Yeah, there's, there's a really interesting uh, lecture on kind of creating companies. I think it's uh, Jason De La Roca is his name. And he was talking about how something a lot of indie companies do is during those early days, they uh, keep track of all the work that they've done as an asset. You know, they sort of say that, okay, I'm worth this much per hour and I worked 40 hours this week, which means I've invested this much in the company. And while it may seem like sunk costs, it's actually kind of like a demonstration of like the real value that's going inside the company and probably helps keep people focused uh, versus, you know, just this is my hobby and I'm making a game for fun. Um, Cause it's a pretty, it's a pretty you know, different mindset between the two. Um, I know one indie company that they kept track of all their sort of sweat equity. And as a group, they spent a million and a half dollars of kind of sweat equity of their own time before they uh, got any funding at all, which, you know, yeah. is what it takes to launch a company these days. But it also means you own the company when you're done, which is great. Yeah, that's a much better result. But the uh, the bootstrapping or the sweat equity they put in, mm. beside the functional or the you know the truth of it having to go through, no matter what, in most cases, yeah. it's also I think a necessary factor to the success of the company, mm. uh, mainly because you're starting to really understand what the commitment is if you're not paid for it, mm. <laughs> because you realize okay, is this going to the right direction? Am I really committed to that level of putting X amount of hours towards this cause? Mm. The answer for us was always yes. Uh, yeah. But he's tiding back for the passion. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you're sneaking up on. I mean, like finish line is the wrong word, right? But you're sneaking up on on at least a, a release that sets you up for the next game, which is exciting. Uh, at least. Yeah, I'm I'm crazy excited. At least. <laughs> I mean, like, yeah. Anyways, I'll definitely have to like do exactly what you hope the audience does, which is sort of match themes with music inside the game. I think it'll be play out. <laughs> cool. All right. We'll play soon. No worries. Uh, okay, so this has been a lot of fun, Luca. Thank you for this. This is great. Yeah. All right, cool. I'll ping on Discord after this. We'll, we'll decompress a little while once the camera's turned off. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right. So uh, thank you, Max, for organizing this. Thank you, everybody who's listened in. Uh, if you've got any more questions, uh, either for Luca, for myself, about kind of game design or whatnot, um, you can always email me. I just dropped my email in the chat for anybody who's, who wants to reach out. Uh, I'll always help out where I can.
Thanks, everybody. Yeah, vote for a float. Good call, Max. <laughs> vote for a float. Yes, go for it, guys. It's awesome. There you go. All right, super. Thank you, everybody. Talk soon, Luke.